Plants and animals have a hard time adjusting to rapid changes in the amount or quality of available water. The rapid increase in human population over the last century, from 2 billion people in 1910 to 7 billion people in 2010, has created pressure on many environments where humans have transformed the water landscape. The Industrial Revolution, in which large factories started to produce the cars, clothes, and appliances that support the modern lifestyle, accompanied the growth of the human population. Unfortunately, there were few, if any, rules to prevent water pollution during the last century of the Industrial Revolution. In this video, we are going to review three cases that show how humans have negatively impacted the water system and the environment. In the United States in the 1960s and 70s, there was a massive increase in industrial production. The automobile industry drove growth in the cities surrounding the Great Lakes. There were no laws or regulation at the time to control pollution, and this resulted in much of the industrial byproducts and waste being dumped into the local rivers and lakes. One river, the Cuyahoga, was so polluted that it started to catch on fire frequently. Let's hear one resident's first-hand account of living on the river during that time. And we all know about the river fire of 69. And as, as somebody who's interested in the history of Cleveland and Cuyahoga River, I know that wasn't the best fire. You know, I know there was other fires that could have burned down Cleveland had not the wind shifted to the, from the north. I remember a 52 fire, I think, that was, uh, I think that one probably would have won the prize for the best fire. I was actually working the day that the river caught on fire, actually working as a hatch tender on the ships. So it's kind of unusual when somebody would yell fire and tell you to run away from the river, because the river is generally water. But when you were working down on the river at that time, the river was like a cauldron. It would just bubble up oxygen trying to get out of the river. It had a coat of oil on it. And you'd see rats float down the river the size of dogs, bloated from whatever it was that they ingested. And there was a rule that if you fell in the river, you immediately went to the emergency room in the hospital. So the idea, that, the, the idea here was don't fall in the river. The Cuyahoga River is just one site on this map. There are dozens of other sites that remain contaminated even today. These sites are the legacy of industrial growth in the United States during an era when there was no control by the government and little concern by the citizens for what was considered a vast water resource. The Great Lakes hold 84% of all the fresh water in North America and over 20% of the world's total fresh water. This historical pollution continues to threaten this valuable resource. In recent years, industrial growth and the population explosion in China has had similar impacts on water resources in that country. What are the impacts on water quality in China? The Huai River flows for over 600 miles across the middle of China providing water for 150 million people. I was born on the banks of the Huai River. It was in 1987 that I grew worried about the problem of water pollution in the river. I'd gone back to take pictures of the scenery, but there no longer was any scenery. Instead, I found myself taking photos of people dredging up dead fish. Huo Daishan gave up his job as a news photographer to save the Huai. Research took him to its main tributary, the Sha Ying. Nearly half a million tons of human sewage a day are tipped into it, plus a million tons of untreated wastewater from paper mills, tanneries, chemical works. Some use processes banned elsewhere. Their effluents include ammonia, cyanide, arsenic. Water from this river has flowed through irrigation channels into villages and sunk into the ground. People who drank this polluted groundwater just became ill. The water of this river, the black and stinking water, takes death with it wherever it flows. It really is a river of death. Both China and the Great Lakes are examples of problems that are easy to see and understand. But sometimes water contamination cannot be seen and the effects are harder to understand. Let's learn a bit more about the unseen threat in The Drugs We Wash Away. Your drinking water is safe. 
But there are risks related to pharmaceuticals in water for animals in rivers and lakes. For instance, female hormones in the pill contribute to feminization of male wild fish, and low concentrations of an anti-anxiety drug have affected the behavior of carp, making them less social and eat faster, which makes them more vulnerable to predators. The unpredictability of these effects was shown in Asia. Vultures ate corpses of cows treated with diclofenac and died as a result. Populations fell by over 90%. So clearly, it's a good idea to reduce the input of pharmaceuticals into the environment. But how do human drugs get into the environment in the first place? When you apply medication on your skin, part of it will always wash off. And when you take drugs, some is absorbed or changed by your body, while some is excreted unchanged. It all ends up in the wastewater treatment plant. There are around 3,000 pharmaceutical compounds on the market, and treatment plants deal well with some and not so well with others. So some drugs always make it into the rivers, and some remain in the treatment sludge, which is often used as fertilizer in agriculture. I know those stories are a bit difficult to hear. For many of us, it seems like nothing can be done. But the story is not over. Citizens, teachers, Policymakers and private companies have been working on solutions to many of these problems for more than 50 years. So what are some of the solutions that people have been working on? We came up with three categories to demonstrate how research, corporate responsibility, and citizen actions can help take responsibility for cleaning up our water. First, scientists can conduct research to understand what the harmful effects humans are having on water systems in order to structure laws and regulations. Secondly, corporations need to take responsibility for reducing the amounts of toxic waste generated and the government needs to be responsible for enforcing laws and penalties for improper disposal. Third, citizens need to elect politicians who care for the environment and support policies such as the Clean Water Act, which has a goal of making all bodies of water in the United States swimmable and fishable by eliminating pollutants and enhancing aquatic ecosystems. While these solutions are a good start, there's plenty of work left to do. We need to educate our children and teach them the importance of water for us as well as for the environment. By educating the next generation about the mistakes made in the past, they hopefully won't make the same mistakes again in the future. And more importantly, they might find some new solutions that we would have never thought of.